Hello and welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. And in this episode, I want to talk about high leverage skills. So at the end of my last episode on comparative advantage, I talked briefly about high leverage skills. So the idea is to optimally develop a specialty in order to earn FU money as efficiently as makes sense, and then pursue what I call simple high leverage skills to reduce your cost of living, right? Because freedom equals uh, how much money you have, FU money, over your cost of living. And uh, so you, you want to optimize income as much as possible, but it, it tends to be easier to reduce your cost of living than to increase your income. You want to pay attention to both, uh, but there's a lot to be had by pursuing a reduction in cost of living. So this two-pronged approach increases your freedom, uh, your freedom from having to work a lot. Okay, so that's that's kind of the context in which uh, high leverage skills make sense. Um, but what specifically do I mean by simple high leverage skills? So th this just means skills that are most efficient at reducing your overall cost of living, right? And so I'm defining simple leverage here as the amount of work it takes to decrease your cost of living. Um, now, now of course, there, there are more variables to consider when it comes to mature post-consumer lifestyle design, right? But for now, we're just looking at buying personal freedom via cost of living reduction as efficiently as possible. I'm going to talk about this more in a second. That there's a lot more to life than money and cost of living and frugality and stuff, but there is there are payoffs to spending some time thinking about it uh, and, and pursuing cost of living reduction. <clears throat> so for now, skill leverage, what I'm calling skill leverage, you can kind of think of it as equal to the the dollars of expenses reduced per how much time and energy it takes you to spend on the skill. Now, now there's, there's two kinds of time you have to expend for skill development, right? There's the time you have to invest in learning the skill up front. And then there's this, there's the amount of time you have to spend deploying the skill, like op operating the skill, right? So, um, cooking, for example, there's some amount of time you have to learn, you, you have to expend, you have to invest in learning how to cook. And then there's the amount of time it takes you to prepare meals, right? The nice thing with cooking is like time investment, like you can kind of combine those. Like oftentimes, like if you're following a recipe, that's that's kind of, that's sort of the amount of time it takes for like operational use of this skill, uh, like reading a recipe, blah, 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 doing that. And then as you repeat that recipe or as you repeat that process, you kind of get a gist for okay, this is how I cook. So it's almost more like, you know, at the beginning, it might take you, you know, two hours to prepare a meal. Whereas, you know, a month into the skill development, just by cooking a lot, that will that will only take you, you know, 30 minutes, um, just be, because you're getting used to it. So at any rate, so so I guess my point of saying that is that Sometimes it's not so useful to draw a sharp distinction between uh, skill, like investing in skill development versus just doing the thing. Often learning the thing is just doing the thing. Um, so watch out for that. Um, so a high leverage skill obviously is where you don't spend a whole lot of time, but you get a lot of uh, cost of living reduction from the amount of skill, right? So... A negative example would be like making your own clothes from scratch is a pretty low lever is a pretty low leverage skill. Uh, it, it takes a lot of work to learn uh, to make clothes. Well, I speak this not from experience. I've never tried, but I've known some people who sew, and it, it's a whole thing. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time to make each garment. Uh, but clothes are cheap. Like if you want to clothe yourself, um, you know, well and adequately, it's not that difficult. Like you, you, that there are a lot of inexpensive clothes that can be had ethically, um, whether that's your, because you're pursuing a strategy of buying high quality clothes that don't, uh, that don't fall apart soon and they're timeless and they don't go out of fashion, uh, or because you're learning the skill of finding 
clothes uh, that fit well and look good, etc. From uh, thrift stores uh, and consignment shops and things like that. So one way or another, like uh, it is not that difficult to clothe yourself well for not very much money, um, and and learning to sew is just a whole thing. So in other words, the cost of living reduction is low or even zero, and the time requirement is very high. Now, let me clarify. I'm not arguing that you shouldn't learn to make your own clothes if you want to, just because it's not a high leverage skill. I am pointing out that I am just pointing out that it is a low leverage skill in terms of cost of living reduction. If you want to make your own clothes because you're stoked to, you know, your desire to do that is justification enough. It's not necessary to make up the story for why you're doing it. So just, you know, understand this is one uh, framework for evaluating skills. And just because it doesn't pass the high leverage test, the, the simple high leverage test doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It just means like, don't pretend it's something that it's not. Now compress, contrast that with learning to cook. Learning to cook simple, tasty food, it's a very high leverage skill. Um, and you know, w when most people think of learning to cook, they think that like they have to learn French cooking or watch Gordon Ramsay videos or something fancy. Um, n no, like simple cooking, simple eating, simple meals are a thing. Like type in simple cooking, you know, that's the whole thing. There's a whole genre of like three ingredient or five ingredient cooking. There's instant pot cooking, batch cooking where you, you know, you take like, Sunday afternoon, you spend a few hours cooking and you cook like the vast majority of the food that you eat for the rest of the week. Um, there's approaches to cooking that are designed to reduce the amount of time you have to spend in meal prep and, uh, and, and, and also, uh, reduce the chances of you screwing the whole thing up, you know? So like trying to learn fancy cooking, if you don't have any cooking skills, uh, like you're making a souffle or something like that, like, Hey, that's great if you're into it. Uh, but it can be frustrating because you screw up. Like, um, I, I'm not into fancy cooking. It's just not my jam. I, I like the, I, <laughs> I want to want to be a fancy cook, but I don't actually. Uh, so I just cook really simple meals, uh, for myself, the tasty, the nutritious, they don't take a lot of time. And that suits me really well. Uh, if that's your story, just embrace it. It's fine. Um, So you can save hundreds of dollars a month for a few hours of skill investment and then uh, minutes per day of operational time for meal prep. I think a lot of times people eat out just because it seems faster or simpler, but once you've gotten, once you've reached a certain point of skill when it comes to cooking, uh, cooking yourself takes less time than like going out to restaurants, particularly if you factor in the amount of time it takes to earn the money to buy the food. Uh, then it becomes a total no brainer. But even if you discount that, um, often like, unless you live like above a restaurant that you like or something like that, um, going to restaurants will take actually more time, more of your life. Now, so learning to cook is like the ideal poster child of high leverage skills. It applies to basically everyone. Everyone has to eat. Um, but other, other skills can be more circumstantial. So, uh, another one that's fairly slim dunk is learning to work out or exercise without a gym membership or f uh, really expensive equipment. This requires an investment of, you know, maybe a dozen hours. If you want to really nerd out about it, it, it could take even less than that. Uh, and the operational time investment is on par with whatever you were doing in the gym before, except that you don't have to spend the time to get to the gym because you're doing it at home or, you know, run, running around your neighborhood or whatever you're doing. The cost of living reduction here is easily 50 to $150 a month, perhaps even more if you include sort of secondary expenses associated with gym memberships. Learning to ride and maintain a bike to get around your city instead of daily driving a car, you know, that's an investment of a handful of hours, potential cost of living reduction of hundreds of dollars a month. And uh, another reason to cancel your gym membership, right? Because who needs to go pay to go do cardio when you pedal 10 miles a day or whatever. Um, learning how to organize low and no extra cost social gatherings within your social group. Lots of people hang out at bars and restaurants just because it's easy and that's what everyone else does. It becomes the default solution, right? It takes a handful 
of hours to plan and execute a picnic in the park or a group hike or a rooftop hangout to watch the sun go down, a potluck dinner party, right? This practice can reduce cost of living by hundreds of dollars a month, and it connects the skill of of cooking and meal prep with social skills and event planning um, and other things. So this is this is a high leverage skill, not only in terms of cost of living, but in terms of being connected to other skills, other um, good things in your life you might want. I think uh, learning DIY handyman skills uh, can be very circumstantial. You know, if you rent, it's easy to just call the landlord, and oftentimes uh, you can get in trouble if you try to fix stuff yourself. Um, so, you know, just have them deal with it. But if you own your own house or if you van life or if you're on an eco village or, or you work away a lot, uh, if you have a different life circumstance, then DIY skills can be very high leverage indeed. Um, although, you know, handyman skills can take, I, I think the investment in time to learn these skills can be higher and, Everyone has to like break stuff <laughs> uh, in the process of learning handyman skills. I think, uh, excuse me, handy, handy, handy person skills, um, DIY household skills. Uh, you know, but but like learning to clear a pipe mechanically, learning to rewire an outlet, learning to renovate a bathroom, build simple furniture, do concrete work, all these things it, it can save you hundreds and thousands of dollars a year. And it can turn into a skill set that you can potentially get paid for, right? Which increases your income robustness, uh, which is a concept that I mentioned in, in the polymath X skill acquisition episode. Okay, so I, I also think that there's... You can, you can think about uh, high leverage skill development in two phases, pre-autonomy and post-autonomy. <laughs> so one context is that you don't have much autonomy yet. You've still got a full-time job or multiple part-time jobs or your freelance gig consumes most of your time, whatever. In this context, it's all about what you can do to reduce your cost of living that requires the least amount of effort. These are these are almost always going to be skills related to the big three, housing, transportation, and food. Um, you know, We're looking for quick cost of living reductions with as little time invested as possible. You know, so for me, some examples from my own life, um, for housing, um, I built, I built my own house, Serenity, right? The cargo trailer conversion. So I, I own my own house. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, a year, year and a half ago, I built my studio. So I kind of have two little tiny house, micro house situations. I own them. I don't pay rent. I don't pay insurance. Um, I don't pay a mortgage. Um, and, and part of these, part of these skill development, I also had to learn how to design and build off grid PV systems. I had to learn when I was traveling in Serenity, I had to learn how to boondock, which is definitely a skill. I had to learn how to tow a trailer safety, how to set up a truck to tow. You know, I had to modify my truck so that it could safely tow. Uh, you know, I had to learn about tiny house construction, which was slightly different than cargo trailer conversion. Uh, I had to slash am still learning about seismic retrofitting. All these other things. Uh, and and another, another dimension of that is, you know, right now I live on the family land. And part of the skill of living with no rent cost is the skill of living with my parents, on, you know, on the, farm, on the family land. I don't mean to make it sound like super hard or difficult. My parents are wonderful and like living with your parents is not rocket science. But I and, and most people in, in the West... We're not brought up in a culture where multi-generational occupancy is normalized. And so it is a bit of a, of a learning curve. Uh, there's a social and emotional skill and competence involved in it. And if I didn't have those skills, if I didn't possess those skills, and if I wasn't fortunate to have really wonderful parents, like this isn't an option that would be available to me. I wouldn't be able to do it. Or my quality of life would be low. Like if my emotional and social skills ability to uh, live on the land with my parents was low, uh, my my quality of life would be low. But it's actually high. It's actually increased because the amount of quality time that I'm able to spend with my parents, which is which is not something that most uh, adults are able to do. And I feel really fortunate to be able to spend this time uh, with my parents. Uh, so so that's that's like kind of pre. So, so there's the high leverage skills as pre-autonomy. The other context, the other phase 
is post autonomy skill development. And that's when you start to have more autonomy, maybe because you've quit your full-time job or whatever you're doing for income or whatever, it just takes less of your time. So the imperative to seek only slam dunk high leverage skills, it's gone down uh, just because you have more time and attention to work with. So, so by this point, you've already taken care of the obvious low hanging fruit. And so you're looking for subtler approaches that take that, that might take more time up front to get going. Uh, but they return profound benefits down the line. And in particular, if you employed the crowbar method uh, of buying freedom for yourself, some of the skill development might look like developing the skills to keep your to keep your cost of living down, but increase your quality of life. So the crowbar method is like the 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 fast, hard, aggressive uh, approach to reducing your uh, your expenses. Um, it is not necessarily fun. Uh, it's not for everyone. Uh, it is for me. I love the crowbar method. Uh, it's how I do pretty much everything. Um, but sort of phase one of the crowbar method is, you know, crowbar your expenses down. Just be like, all right, you know, last month I spent $800 on food. This month I'm going to spend $200 on food. And if I run out of money, it's dumpster cups, cupcakes for me. Right. Um, or just scrounging in the pantry and I'm just going to eat rice, right? It's uncomfortable. And it's, that's not like how you want to live eating dumpster cupcakes and like rice. Um, but it motivates you to, uh, learn the skills so that you're not eating dumpster cupcakes. That's, that's kind of the point. Um, so for example, you know, in your, in your pre autonomy phase, maybe you decreased your food expenses by learning to cook like, okay, oatmeal, I know how to fry eggs and I know how to make beans and rice with sauteed vegetables and hot sauce. And like, that's all you eat. <laughs> now that you've got more autonomy. Uh, you'd like to learn to cook more than just those things and introduce a little variety in your life. Uh, so your cost of living might not change at all, but your, your quality of life is increasing. In my pre autonomy phase, this would be like 2020 and 2021. My cost of living dropped like a stone. Um, and then I got more autonomy when I got laid off, which was wonderful. And, you know, my rate of cost of living reduction, it's beginning to taper off. Um, in, in the beginning, it was easy to find actions to do or to stop doing that would reduce my cost of living by hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, now that my cost of living is in the, you know, 400 to $800 a month range, uh, there, there's no more three figure reduction actions to take. So in the in the immediate post autonomy phase, I think this the focus on skill devel development begins to shift from being money centric, which is where you're just focused on how much can I reduce my cost of living, how much freedom can I buy with this skill, to vocational and Stoke centric. Right in um, two ep two episodes ago, three episodes ago, uh, in polymathic skill acquisition, I talked about the three categories of skills. They're being uh, fundamental, vocational, and Stoke centric. Um, so, uh, as you shift to vocational and Stoke centric, these are ideas like how can I develop and mature my ability to show up and engage in the world, help people, creatively self express, produce value, find meaning and fulfillment, explore, discover, etc. All these other things, all these like wonderful, beautiful things about being a human. At a certain point, money becomes largely irrelevant to the skills you choose to pursue. And that's kind of what the aim is. Your, your cost of living is optimized for your lifestyle and you maintain a high level of robust autonomy. Money is more or less solved and you don't need to think about it too much. So you don't. And this is my thesis here. The, my thesis here is that autonomy is the foundation. There's a lot more to skill development and life in general than just cost of living reduction, right? But cost of living reduction is the fastest no brainer slam dunk method to increase your autonomy so that you can go, go pursue those other higher, more interesting things. And so to me, it makes sense to pursue it aggressively in the early phases, like pursue it aggressively. So you don't have to think about it anymore. You know, for me, one of the reasons I'm not a naturally frugal person, and I'm not, uh, I had to work really hard to get uh, my cost of living really low. Uh, 
it's because I don't like thinking about money. It's boring to me. And I, I used to have, I still probably have some psychological baggage around money. Like I thought it was dirty and bad. So I just like, didn't think about it. <laughs> um, which is, I don't recommend that. Um, so I, I'd, I'd much rather spend my attention on just about anything else other than money. Before I began developing post-consumer skills, this attitude towards money uh, caused me to trap myself. Like I had to keep working a lot and I had to keep earning because I spent all my money because I didn't pay any attention to it. And I, and I wasn't just, you know, accidentally naturally frugal. Now that I've spent a couple of years paying very close attention indeed to money, I'm entering a phase where I can go back to not thinking about money. But since I've internalized high leverage skills and arranged uh, my lifestyle in a post-consumer way, my autonomy is going to continue to increase. I'm not going to trap myself. I put in a burst of intense focus on money initially, and the payoff is that I'm not going to have to think about it much in the future. One of my favorite books that I highly recommend for everyone is The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin. Uh, he's uh, the movie um, Searching for Bobby Fisher was based on him. Uh, in the book, he describes how beginning chess players, and I know very little about chess, uh, so I'm just going off memory here, but he describes how beginning chess players, they learn a point system. It, assound, it assigns values to pieces. So you can calculate uh, a, a move... You can calculate if, you know, using a rook to take a knight that will then be taken by a pawn. Like, is that a good move or not? Are you coming out ahead or behind based on the, the point system? Uh, and so this is called running the numbers. And beginning chess players, they they run the numbers all the time. They're doing all these calculations in their head while playing chess games. But this is a phase. Like, grandmasters don't run the numbers. Advanced chess players, they're not doing actual calculations in their head, Right. They internalized the numbers and they no longer have to think about it because they've internalized it. Their attention is elevated to a much higher level perspective on the game. They're thinking about, you, you know, higher level strategies and whatever it is that advanced chess players think about. Um, but, but just because grandmasters don't run the numbers doesn't mean that it's a waste of time to go through a phase of running the numbers like grandmasters, aren't grandmasters because they don't think about numbers. They're grandmasters because they went through the process of thinking about it. Waitzkin writes that you have to run the numbers in order to forget the numbers. And that's a phrase that I think about quite a lot. Run the numbers in order to forget the numbers. And that's what I'm talking about here with high leverage skills and post-consumer praxis. You have to think about money in order to not have to think about money. Uh, think about high leverage, simple high leverage skills in order to not have to do all these calculations of cost of living reduction per hour spent, right? We don't want to be analyzing our lives based on these nerdy financial metrics, uh, unless, unless we get stoked on that and then whatever. But most of us, myself included, I just don't want to spend that much time thinking about it. So I'm going to go through a phase of aggressively thinking about it. So I can internalize it and I can forget it and I can move on to thinking about higher dimensional aspects of my life and existing and being a human. All right. That's it for high leverage skills. Next episode, we're probably going to talk about Stoke. Thanks for listening.